Hey guys, and welcome to the next lecture of Neurology for the Non-Neurologist. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about a couple of neuromuscular emergencies you're likely to see while in service, uh, how to recognize them, and then how to treat them. So as part of my usual disclaimer, remember uh, the series is, is built to help you succeed on your neurology rotation, but it's, it's not an all-encompassing review of the entirety of neurology, and it, it definitely doesn't replace what your uh, seniors and attendings tell you on service. <clears throat> So in this lecture, we're going to be discussing the neuromuscular diseases uh, that can kill a person quickly. So neuromuscular medicine is a very large field that covers a number of patients. Um, but here, I just want to talk about the patients who can get sick and get sick quickly um, and will need to be addressed inpatient. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on two diseases, uh, myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre. Um, and then after that, I'm going to touch on the ever-famous disease ALS and then mention a couple other killers in neuromuscular medicine. So let's get started. So first things first, in order to understand diseases of the peripheral nervous system, you got to have a basic understanding of the organization of the PNS. Uh, specifically, it's divided into six different levels, um, and all these levels have their own unique pathology associated with them. So this includes the anterior and motor horn cells, the root, the plexus, the nerve, the neuromuscular junction, and the muscle. Um, any disease that affects the peripheral nervous system affects one or multiple of these areas. And then the really important thing to understand that helps you uh, dramatically narrow your differential in the PNS is that uh, specifically the anterior horn cell, the neuromuscular junction, and the muscle, the ones I have here with the number one after them, um, present with weakness and only weakness, while associated pain and sensory changes then are instead seen in diseases of the root, plexus, and nerve. By understanding this simple division, you actually can basically cut your differential in half, greatly simplifying workup. So let's look at a couple examples that you're probably familiar with of these um, areas. The anterior horn cell is divided in, or is involved in diseases such as ALS and polio, um, which as we know are associated with weakness but no sensory changes. And then this is the same with the other two areas that don't have sensory changes. So uh, diseases like myasthenia gravis and neuromuscular category and uh, our myositides and dystrophies in the muscle category all just have weakness and no pain or sensory loss. On the other hand, diseases like radiculopathy, Herb's palsy, uh, carpal tunnel, stuff like that are all notoriously painful. Then I want to make a note actually that Guillain-Barre um, affects the nerves and then also actually the roots and plexuses. And so it, it fits into this category of diseases, uh, meaning that it is quite painful, uh, though this component is often overlooked in history taking. That said though, uh, this isn't a lecture about the peripheral nervous system. It's, it's a lecture on neuromuscular emergencies. Um, so let's talk about the most common uh, dangerous neuromuscular disease that you're, you're likely to see in patient. Uh, myasthenia gravis, and then it's associated myasthenic crisis. Um, so as you likely know, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where the body develops antibodies targeted against the acetylcholine receptors of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, so this leads to fatigable weakness, um, can also affect proximal and then also bulbar muscles. Uh, these patients initially will complain of general weakness, diplopia, ptosis, um, but the symptoms you really want to pay attention to are the bulbar symptoms, specifically respiratory distress, dysphagia, and neck weakness or bulbar symptoms, which are signs of a myasthenic crisis. Myasthenic crisis is even more severe than a myasthenic exacerbation, as exacerbation only means worsened weakness, while crisis refers to imminent respiratory failure. Terrifyingly enough, actually about 20% of people with myasthenia, um, with myasthenia present initially in crisis, before they even know that they have the disorder. So you really gotta be on the lookout for this. When you're interviewing a patient to, who you believe is in myasthenic crisis, it's important to determine if they've had any precipitating factors that may have triggered their disease. So as with many chronic diseases, um, a flare can be caused by anything that really puts excessive stress on the body. So um, any big recent illness, surgery, things like that. Um, but beyond this though, it's, it's important specifically in myasthenia to know that there's a number of medications uh, implicated in myasthenic exacerbation. Uh, the list is pretty extensive, but just to name a few of the big ones that you should know about, um, that's things like antibiotics like aminoglycoside and fluoroquinolone, uh, beta blockers can cause it, and actually even just the electrolyte magnesium. So we actually want to keep these people's mag uh, on the lower side. Uh, quick recognition of this and discontinuation of the offending medicine is really important um, in the care of these patients. And then finally, while all the above can suggest myasthenia, the official diagnosis is actually made with antibody testing. Um, we look for both the acetylcholine receptor antibody, which is classic for myasthenia, as well as the musk antibody, which was uh, a recently discovered variant of myasthenia that behaves a little differently. Uh, that said, these antibodies take a while to come back, and it may not be there before you need uh, to decide on treatment or not, so history and physical is key. Uh, 
And speaking of, uh, while the history of myasthenic patients is important, it's really the physical exam that's going to help you uh, triage these patients. Uh, vital signs, including even an O2 sat and an ABG, can actually all be pretty normal in a patient who's on the verge of respiratory failure. Um, instead, you really have to rely on your exam to tell just how sick the patients are. Um, beyond your standard neurologic exam, there's actually a couple tests that we can do with specifically in myasthenic patients to um, test this. Um, to start, you always want to look for the classic presenting symptoms, such as fatigable weakness and repeated reps. So you repeatedly do muscle activation to see if they get weaker. And then also you look for ptosis and diplopia specifically, which should be worsened with prolonged upgaze. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the ptosis and diplopia can actually improve with application of an ice pack, uh, which is a quick test you can actually perform at the bedside in a patient, both to help with diagnosis and then uh, also just to impress your med students because it's pretty cool. Uh, more important components of the physical exam to test are strength of cough and breath count, though. So we'll talk about, um, in a second, some tests that RTs can do to evaluate respiratory function, but the breath count is a really simple test that you can do at bedside that um, helps approximate their respiratory function. Uh, so in order to perform this test, you have the patient take a deep breath in and count as high as they can possibly in one breath. A normal person should be able to surpass 50 and can usually reach 70s, 80s, or even higher. Um, however, as the bulbar muscles weaken and they lose their respiratory drive, this number will drop. So when a breath count reaches the low 30s, you should start to be concerned and place the patient in step down. Uh, once you're reaching a breath count of around 20 or less, you should start considering elective intubation um, because if you start moving towards 10 or single digits, that's when you need emergent intubation. Uh, and then finally, one other very important test in the myasthenic patient is neck flexion and extension. Uh, while we don't typically test this in a standard neurologic exam, it must be tested in these patients as it uh, can really be a, a good outward sign of bulbar dysfunction. So if you have a patient who's unable to raise their head off the bed, for example, you definitely should be worried about impending respiratory failure and should consider intubating the patient. All right, quick break time. Uh, maybe grab an ice pack and try the ice pack test. Um, or if you're like my dog Willow, you could always just grab the nearest cold wall. What a weirdo. That's Willow. But back to myasthenia. So after initially triaging a myasthenic patient with your exam, uh, you need a way to keep a close eye on their respiratory function without having to travel to the bedside every couple hours. So in order to do this, we order neuromuscular parameters every two to four hours. Uh, neuromuscular parameters are two tests performed by our respiratory therapist friends that can effectively monitor and trend respiratory function. And they include the NIF and the FVC. So the NIF or negative inspiratory force, which uh, you can see in the picture here, I guess, um, <laughs> Not, not entirely sure how helpful that picture is. Um, but a NIF is it's generated by taking a really large deep breath in um, as a measurement of a patient's inspiratory strength. Uh, we like to see these numbers usually in the 50s or higher. Um, we really start to get nervous when we're dipping into the 20s or teens. It, it actually approximates the breath count very well. Um, and then force vital capacity, or FVC, is also measured by RTs. And it measures uh, not only the inspiratory, but also the expiratory strength of the patient. And our value here for pending respiratory failure is typically around 15 cc's per, per kilo. And finally, while not part of the neuromuscular parameter set, it's also important to remember that myasthenic patients with respiratory compromise often have concomitant dysphagia. And so it's really important to perform uh, swallowing screens, either just a bedside or a formal swallow study on these patients. So let's talk about treatment of myasthenia. So for patients in myasthenic crisis, uh, we have a couple of options in regards to acute treatment of the crisis, uh, IVIG and plasma exchange, or PLEX. Uh, there's still conflicting literature on if one treatment or the other is more effective, and honestly, both are great therapies for these patients. Uh, usually, a patient or the neurologist knows what they responded best to in the past, and so we follow that recommendation. Uh, but if that's not the case, we, prefer, we usually prefer to give plasma exchange first, um, just because of the fact that if you give IVIG, um, you can give IVIG after plasma exchange, but if you give IVIG before plasma exchange, and then you do start PLEX, um, all you're going to do is filter out all the medicine you gave. Um, that said, PLEX requires placement of a central catheter, and so in emergent or overnight situations, we often will um, just start IVIG. Uh, and finally, uh, during the acute phase, we also want to hold these patients peridostigmine. Uh, so peridostigmine, or mesinon, is it's really a great drug uh, long-term for myasthenics. Um, it plays a role of preventing the breakdown of acetylcholine, effectively giving them increased neuromuscular activity. Uh, however, its cholinergic effects can lead to excessive secretion, uh, which in a patient in myasthenic crisis um, is dangerous because it can aspirate on these. So if you're really struggling to manage the secretions because of weakness, hold the peridostigmine. Uh, 
Uh, that said, though, just make sure that you're holding this in a true myasthenic crisis, because if it's just a myasthenic exacerbation, you may actually um, ex um, worsen it and tip the patient over into a crisis. So another important therapy to discuss in myasthenia gravis is the use of corticosteroids. So steroid use in myasthenia is controversial because um, they're, they're excellent with event, helping with eventual recovery, and they can definitely help with the long-term immunosuppression. Um, but they also have a chance of precipitating an acute worsening in the disease. Uh, so because of this, we often refrain from initiating steroids in the acute setting, unless either we have good control of the patient's disease with something like IVIG or Plex, or if we already secured their airway. Uh, and then finally, we'll often initiate immunomodulators uh, towards the tail end of their hospitalization or at discharge. Um, some important immunomodulators found to be effective in the long-term care of myasthenia includes azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and cyclosporin. And then rituximab has actually been helpful to be, or rituximab has actually been found to be helpful specifically in the musk variant of myasthenia. Uh, we usually start these meds, like I said, at discharge or inpatient just to get them going in the system um, because it's, it's important to remember that medications, especially the, the zithromycin and the mycophenolate, usually take about three to six months to fully kick in. Um, while we're trying to get them there, we'll often bridge them with a steroid taper. And that's it. Uh, myasthenia is a complicated disease, but it's one that at least I find very fascinating. And uh, it's also really important to understand this is a disease that can easily be fatal if it's missed, but it's also quite treatable if it's addressed properly. Uh, so let's quickly review so that you're confident the next time you see it on the wards. Uh, first off, you should be able to recognize the disease. So remember up to 20% of people with myasthenia are first diagnosed within crisis. So they won't always have the diagnosis in their history. Uh, instead, learn to look out for classic symptoms and exam findings of ptosis, diplopia, fatigable weakness, as well as uh, potential triggers and offending meds. In addition to the classic signs, um, always perform a myasthenic focus exam where you evaluate for uh, dangerous findings such as a low breath count, a weak neck flexion or extension, and a weak cough. After triaging your myasthenic patient, make sure you monitor them with, them with Q2 to Q4 hour uh, neuromuscular parameters. Um, and then finally know that we, we treat myasthenia acutely with either IVIG or Plex, um, usually while holding their home mesthenon. And then steroids are controversial um, and usually aren't given in the acute setting until we've otherwise stabilized the patient. Uh, and then finally, we start patients uh, usually at discharge on chronic immune modulation um, once their acute exacerbation is over. And that's it. Um, like I said, myasthenia is a beast, but it's, it's an important disease to understand. Uh, I'll see you in the next lecture where we're going to dig into the other big neuromuscular emergency, uh, Guillain-Barre, as well as a few other uh, dangerous diseases of the peripheral nervous system. So I'll see you then.